Well, good morning. Uh, so glad you are with us and joining us. If you are visiting for uh, the first time, whether on campus or online, you must know this. You are welcomed, loved, safe, and God is well pleased with you. It was a beautiful Thursday evening. The sun was setting. The ocean breeze was gentle. The skies were filled with colors. The views were amazing. The silverware was laid out. The dining table was ready. The food was served as we gathered around the table. It was not a very big family, but it really didn't matter. The sacred spaces were ready, nicely decorated, prepared, space for anointing with oil, space for reflection and contemplation, space for feet to be washed. And indeed, as the bright full moon and its moonlight illuminated the spaces, some were indeed anointed with oil, others reflected and contemplated, and many had their feet washed. What I'm describing to you is our Monday, Thursday service at Calvary by the Sea, just a couple weeks ago. Beautifully prepared by our host, Bridget Nelson. She and her husband, Andrew, are on vacation today, so we send love to them. I think they're in Washington. Certainly this service, though, was one of the most freeing experiences since my arrival to Hawaii. Besides the fact that I get to use slippers all the time, not flip-flops, right, but slippers, that is another very freeing experience, shall we say. But at the beachfront, but at our beachfront, our oceanfront, I had the opportunity to share food, drink with my friends, with my family. I was blessed to wash the feet of several men in our spiritual family. One of them washed my feet. But I could only describe the evening to you in the following manner. It was this slight hint of liberation. The simplicity, the, the nourishment, the peace that filled the space, that filled the moment all happening here at the shores of our beach for a moment in time for just a moment in time shame conflict the things of this world seemed to vanish i've titled today's sermon a hint of liberation Today's wisdom comes from an additional writing, an extra chapter, shall we say, that was added most likely to an already finished gospel. John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, the author of this gospel, asserts some fascinating and clarifying details about Jesus, about Peter, and about himself, about John. Clearly, John wanted the reader to know that he personally experienced the raised Jesus. He wanted to be credited for being a first-hand eyewitness in this chapter, and it certainly does validate that very motif. Still, one must wonder what are John's true motives for adding, for inserting this chapter into an already finished gospel. Perhaps, he wanted to convince the doubters, those who believed that the appearances of Jesus were no more than just hallucinations and visions. But John makes it very clear that Jesus appears in human form, with a crucified body, with uh, wounds and all, because only a human body would be hungry. Only human hands could prepare a breakfast. Only human hands could prepare a fire. Or perhaps 
He wanted to highlight the differences between he and Peter. He does, after all, describe himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Can you imagine describing yourself in such a way? Moses, the disciple whom Jesus loved. As to say that not all the disciples were loved like he was loved. And then he presents Peter as this disciple, this flawed disciple who will one day grow old and will be crucified. If you keep reading the scripture, Peter asks Jesus, what about him? Referring to John. In other words, how will John die, Jesus? And I love Jesus' response because he says, if I want him to remain until I arrive and I return, what is that to you? Do you see the numerous reasons why John added this extra chapter to an already finished gospel? Nonetheless, the image of the raised Jesus, wounds and all, unbound body and all, cooking breakfast, fish, bread, and wine for his disciples on the shore of the beach, that image entirely changes this whole moment for me. Think about it. The food, the smell of fish on a grill, the joy, the revelation, the nourishment, the smiles, the love, the simplicity, the gentleness, the freedom. Somehow, Jesus continues to see a need to appear to his disciples, this being his third appearance. The disciples know who he is, and yet they are afraid to ask him who he is. They are full of the Spirit. They are full of joy because they have seen the raised Jesus alive, and yet something was missing. When they finished breakfast, Jesus intentionally turns his attention to Simon Peter and offers three questions and three comments that have probably uh, are engraved in the memory of Peter until this day. Do you love me? Feed my lamb. Do you love me? Tend to my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You see, here in those questions and in those comments enters perhaps the wisdom for us this morning. And I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to be somewhere else <laughs> thinking about the fish. I want you to be for a moment centered on the fact that there is wisdom that enters the space, enters the room today. Doesn't matter who's here, who's not here. Doesn't matter your background, your age, where you've lived, where you come from. You know, there's something about the, the divine that is transcendent, that goes beyond, that is universal, that, is, that speaks to everyone in the room. I once was told that the gospel is like a baseball game and everyone's watching the same game, but some of us are behind the backstop. And some of us are down the third base line or the first base line, or some of us are out in the bleachers, outfield. But yet we're all watching the same game, but we have a different perspective. You see, that is the invitation today. The Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, our counselor, who is, who is here this morning, listens to us. We bring our, uh, our concerns, our, our, our ambiguities, our uncertainties, our, our pain, our suffering. We bring all of that today to the divine, to the benevolent God, who is with us, listening to us. And so we bring all of that into this space so to not miss the wisdom that God has for us this morning. And here it is. Because this wisdom, I believe, helps us and helps us to understand what it means to be human. You see the repetitive cycle of shame, of conflict, of violence. It vanishes at the slightest hint of liberation. Did you hear me? The cycle, the repetitive cycle of shame and conflict, it somehow vanishes at the slightest hint of liberation. But let me explain it the best that I can. I don't want to get too theological on you. 
But to do this, I want to use the life of Peter to make a point. Because Peter's life is the epitome of shame and conflict. In Scripture, Peter tells Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Yet later, he denies knowing Jesus three times. On one instance, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Peter, upon you I will build my church. Yet in another instance, Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You see, Peter is a living, breathing, walking contradiction. All in, and yet not in at all. Talks a lot, but does not walk the talk. Speaks with great confidence and assurance, and yet when the pivotal moment arrives, cowardice overwhelms him. Still, it is the raised Jesus at the beach who meets Peter ever so gently, ever so softly, with a full tummy of fish, bread, and wine, with transparent questions that are only here to help Peter ponder his humanity and his love. In fact, what Jesus is offering is liberation. Three questions of love that erase three statements of denial. An end to the repetitive cycle of shame and conflict within Peter. And I wonder... How many Peters are in the room today? Perhaps we are all Peters. In search of the slightest hint of liberation, in pursuit of the smallest glimpse of hope, longing to have breakfast on the beach with Jesus because true nourishment and true food changes us forever. And I guess what I'm saying to you this morning is that this sermon is for all of those who need to hear some good news. That this sermon is for all of those who are seeking some liberation, some healing, some peace, some hope, some joy. Because there is something, or even seeking some, some fish, some bread, and some wine. Because there is something, I believe, inherently spiritual about gathering around a table. It's something that is so central to the Jesus narrative that we gather around this table, food, it, it, it brings us together. Food, it unites us. You, food is like the, the language of unity. When we gather and we don't know what to say to one another and we don't know how to express ourselves to one another, it's like food fills in the gaps. And yet Jesus knows this so well, right? This is why he cooks breakfast for his disciples. Because he wants to spend time with them. He wants to feed them. He wants to nurture them. He wants to care for them. This is why Jesus cooks breakfast. This is why he's there in front of the shoreline cooking breakfast for his disciples. But you have to realize, in the midst of that moment, in that space, in that time, is where Peter is redeemed, healed, I would say to you, liberated. And called. Called to tend to the sheep. Called to feed his lambs. Called to care for the people of God. In other words, to do the very same thing that he's experiencing with the rest of the world. By the way, we are the extension of what happened that day. Because Peter went off and started the church. Peter went off and did all the things that Jesus called him to do. He went off and shared that same feeling, that same moment of food and liberation and restoration to the rest of the world. But see, I wonder how many of us this morning need liberation, need to be restored so to live out our calling in this world, so to share liberation, hope, healing, restoration with others. Because essentially Jesus is asking Peter to be a shepherd like him, to love like he loves, to care like he cares, because Jesus' love is a costly love. It is more than words, it is more than emotions, it's more than just a smile or a handshake. Because when you love like Jesus, you end up carrying a cross. When you love like Jesus, you may just end up crucified on a cross. Because a true shepherd 
is willing to care for his sheep, to die for his sheep, to protect the sheep from wolves, to love in a self-sacrificing way, to love for the well-being of the sheep. And this morning, see, I believe Jesus is asking us the same question that he asked Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? If you do, if you say, yes, I love you, then Jesus says to you, then love like I love. Care like I care. Do you love me, Calvary by the sea? If so, then love like Jesus loves. Care like Jesus cares. One more thing. I want to speak to my people today. I want to speak to my peeps this morning, to all the communities who are on the edges and on the fringes, to the communities that are at the bottom, rejected, oppressed, forgotten, that you would listen to me this morning with an open heart and an open mind. Because although we've experienced marginalization or we've experienced rejection or hate or you can categorize it as racism or sexism or transphobia, homophobia or xenophobia, although we encountered all of those inauthentic things in the church, unjust, exclusive, a church that is set in its ways, this does not excuse us from the primary thing that God has called us to do to love like him, and to care like him. By the way, if we are to love, we are to also love our enemies. The language of the scripture says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Did you hear me? How else will the repetitive cycle of shame and conflict come to an end? How else will this cycle stop unless someone stops it? We cannot give up so easily on the church. Even if our reasonable arguments, and they are very reasonable arguments, one must remember that Jesus is not the church because the church is flawed. The church is very, 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 very sick. Filled with sinful and selfish systems. Filled with selfish and sinful people. But what did you expect? See, the church is just a bunch of Peters. A living, breathing, walking paradox. But see, the thing about the church is that that it also carries the remedy to it all. It carries the true and authentic medicine for the world. Do you see the paradox? Jesus, who is the good shepherd, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, clearly was a man of his word, willing on his own accord to give his life on a cross to die for his sheep, takes away our shames, our mistakes, our failures, our transgressions, our conflict, and gives us his forgiveness, his successes, and his righteousness. Giving it all for all of us, for all of his sheep, giving us liberation. But what do we do with such liberation? What can we do with such freedom, with such hope and joy and grace and healing and love, such authentic joy? And what do we do with such a thing? Certainly we cannot walk back out into the world now knowing that we have this liberating love in us. Perhaps we can respond like Peter did after the third question. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Help us, Jesus, to love like you love. To care like you care. Remind us that in the weekly nourishment of eating this bread and this wine, we have breakfast with you, with the raised Jesus. Thus encountering liberating food, that puts an end to the cycle, makes us new. 
You see, putting the end to a cycle of conflict and violence and shame is simultaneously the beginning of a new season, of a new start, of a new reality, a new dance, a new flow that is set into motion by the three-in-one creator, redeemer, and sustainer because the end, Listen to this, because the end, despite what you may have heard in other Christian traditions, despite if you watched a movie in the 70s or 80s, despite what you may see on television today, the end is not about being left behind. The end is not about destruction and chaos and war and death or anything like that. Instead, the end will look like the renewal of all creation, a new cycle where sky, earth, seas, humanity are being made new, everything being healed, everything being repaired, everything being put back together. Because creation is inherently good, it is inherently very good as declared in the Genesis narrative. And our Trinitarian God is benevolent with us, is for us, is with us. Why would we want to leave such goodness, such creation, such love, such presence? You see, the end will be more visible when we start loving and caring like Jesus loves and cares. That's when we will see more and more of the end when we start gathering together around the table. People from different backgrounds and ages, ethnicities, colors, genders, identities, traditions, religions. When we start seeing that, then you will be able to see the end. You will be able to see and say, Pastor Moses, that looks like the end. It is all being put back together. Lord, I just pray that we can love like you, that we can care like you. For in doing so, we participate in the new flow of everything being reconciled, everything being liberated. All we get to do is to step into it. We're all invited. We're all invited. We all just need to step in to that flow. Word of God and word of life. And we all say together, thanks be to God. Let us pray.